Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at the well known Boston house price data set uh, and apply multiple regression and random forest um, on the data set, which is made up of 506 observations with uh, 13 columns. So 506 rows with 13 uh, uh, attributes or features, and we're going to try and predict the median. Uh, house price index for that area. The areas are based on census track, right? And I think we've 2010, this is a map of Boston. Uh, the greater Boston area uh, sprawls out much further than this. I think across this side is Cambridge and uh, somewhere around here you have um, the, I think it's MIT. Um, and then you have the, I think this is the Charles River. So um, there may be um, some evidence that uh, uh, properties closer to um, uh, waterways and so on uh, can sometimes be more prestigious type addresses, but then you have to offset against that um, maybe more commercial use and properties, which uh, can reduce value of properties. Okay, so there's a lot of, when we look at the map, we can see that there is a high degree of nuance here in the data and straightforward linear relationships may not actually be that uh, readily observable. The original data set comes from this 1978 paper by Harrison and Rubenfeld, who looked at hedonic prices and demand for clean air. Again, one of the, uh, takeaways, uh, they um, observed uh, in that paper that there was a higher demand. Um, people were willing to pay a premium for higher quality air, but that uh, it worked within submarkets and the elasticities varied quite considerably. So uh, in many respects, uh, this idea that straightforward linear relationships were in operation uh, seems not to apply here. And that's why maybe random forest uh, brings uh, some additional benefits to the analysis. Um, I took, uh, you might follow, these are the links to the original paper. This is a PDF copy. If you click, it'll lead, bring you to the paper. And then also I found this uh, kernel on the Kaggle by Shea, Run. I think that may not be uh, completely a name, but this also I found very useful uh, when going through. So quite a bit of the code here, I recycled into this Google Colab um, and a good place that to continue with the analysis here uh, is this uh, lab here. So you may just uh, Shaudhuri, right? And he's from Chennai in India. So, um, I, I thought it was quite an, a nice uh, Python notebook and uh, I benefited a lot from going through it. Um, okay, so uh, we import in then in a fairly standard fashion, then we import in pandas for organizing our data, NumPy for mathematical operators, SK, SkyKit Learn, um, we'll use for um, the machine learning and for uh, the aggress regression analysis, matplotlib, Seaborn, uh, both for uh, graphing. And uh, we, the in the sky SK learn um, uh, library, we can import directly in the Boston data set. So there's a few, there's not many. R seems to be better at preloading in data sets, uh, but there are a few in the SK learn. And we just, uh, by executing that bit of code, we can bring it in and then uh, we can read it in and we'll call it data. So very simply, we're going to refer to the Boston data as data. And then if we take a look at the first couple of rows, the first five rows, uh, we can see uh, we don't have the variable names, the column names here, but we can observe uh, the data that we have. And if we want to get the names, uh, they come under uh, this heading here, Boston Future Names. So we have CRIM, ZN, Indus, uh, 
it's the Charles River, uh, Knox, and so on. Uh, there's quite a good data description in the uh, paper uh, here towards the end, if I am correct. In the appendices, there is some somewhere in the paper here. Let's see. Uh, table four, right? Uh, there is some description of these variables, uh, a little bit more detailed than what we have here in the Google Colab. Uh, but what's here is probably uh, relatively good. Um, the CRIM is the per capita crime rate per town. So we would suspect that when we look at our data uh, that the uh, median house price in a given electoral, in a given census track um, is uh, negatively correlated with uh, the amount of crime in a given, given uh, census track. Um, ZN is the proportion of residential land zone for lots over 25,000 square feet. So this is for larger properties. And one would imagine if we had these larger plots that are zoned, uh, the area might be more affluent and then maybe the median price might for the property might be a bit higher. Industrial um, proportion of non-retail business acres per town so in a given sense track, how much non-retail in a retail area, it may be business, but uh, maybe industrial units might also correlate with lower prices. Uh, nobody wants to live next door to a factory. CHAS denotes the Charles River. And again, you could imagine when we take a look at Boston, maybe the more prestigious properties would have some sea frontage or not too far away from the sea frontage typically. Uh, close to the sea, close to a river, there may be pathways and parks and things and more amenities. So it may attract higher price. Um, and again, this data goes back to 19, the early 1970s. Um, the original paper looked closely at these nitric oxides and the higher the air pollution, one would imagine house prices would suffer as a consequence. Uh, we would also expect that as the average number of rooms in a dwelling increased, the properties became more valuable. Uh, the age, uh, the proportion of owner-occupied units built prior to 1940, so if you have a newer build and better insulated, more modern housing might sometimes be worth more, all else being equal. The distance to employment centers, uh, access to highways. Now this. This is interesting, of course, access to infrastructure is important, but then if you're very close to highways, uh, that may um, interfere with um, your uh, quality of life. And a lot of those highways built, big infrastructure projects, uh, cut through old uh, areas, rundown areas uh, in the larger, uh, urban areas in the 1960s and 1970s as highways were uh, built across the US. Uh, tax, one might imagine the higher the amount of tax uh, that might depress uh, property prices. Uh, in the US, uh, living in an area, in, in fact, in any uh, urban setting, one can imagine uh, the better the schools, if we consider pupil-teacher ratio a proxy for the quality of schools, one might imagine that as the pupil-teacher ratio went up, um, school quality, the teaching, education might suffer, and then properties in those census tracts, uh, the median price might suffer. Uh, this is a, a, a measure of the proportion of blacks by town. So this is the extent to which um, minority populations might be living in a given area, census track. Uh, the percentage of lower status population. Uh, so people with, without certain educational attainment, the greater proportion without high school diplomas and so on might indicate a drop off in property prices. And then we have the median value of the property in thousands of dollars. So uh, we, if we run this code, we can apply the feature names to our columns. So we have a more complete data set and then we'll incorporate in the target variable, which is the price. And now uh, in addition, we've built into the data frame, if you like, uh, the property price. 
So we might examine then what's in that property using data shape. There's 506 uh, rows, 14 columns, so 13 features and one target, 506 census tracts and the median prices for those properties in those census tracts. And then we might have a look at the columns, what's in there. Uh, might take a look at the type of values we have. They're numerical. Um, are we missing values? Um, um, and uh, the un unique, so in some instances we have for the Charles River, it's binary. Should we, okay, so when we're looking for unique values or non-unique values in the, with the Charles River, it's uh, um, you either live beside the river or not. So it's either zero or one. Uh, so that's why we just have two uh, values here. But then um, one might imagine uh, pupil teacher ratios could vary from one to 46 and so on. So there's quite a bit of variation across, um, but um, this is a, a useful way just to get a sense of what's in that data, what variation in terms of the values that might apply in each instance. Then to see, is there any variables, any cells not populated? This is quite useful because it takes the sum of those empty cells for each column. And it looks like our data set is, there's no missing values, so it's quite pristine in that respect. And then are we missing any uh, variables in terms of the names uh, that apply uh, to the columns? And there's none, they're, they're all full, again, good. Uh, descriptive statistics then give us another, uh, you know, we, we might want to know the mean the standard deviation so for instance, uh, the high, highest uh, uh, pupil teacher ratio, uh, 22, uh, and the minimum was 12. So looks like there wasn't as much, much variation as I thought. Now we have 12.6. So um, you're averaging, of course. Okay, so we have 12. Okay, we're using variables then that are, um, between uh, not full numbers. So we're averaging out in many instances. We have to average out across the class, different class sizes in a school. So we do have quite a bit of variability, but it would maximum 22, that wouldn't seem too bad. And the minimum 12, would, which would look really good. Uh, then we might uh, use some box plus box plots to get a sense of the, the spread of the variable. So this is for the price. And we can see there are quite a few outliers and we have the first quartile, the, 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 the fourth quart, the, uh, quartile, the median values. Um, again, in terms of we do that for crime, we can see there's a lot of outliers. So a lot of the time the crime can be quite low, but then there are areas where it's quite uh, pronounced. And we can look at the, again, the main trust of the original paper was to look at how uh, the value we might attach or the premium we might attach to living in an area that has clean air. And then what are the factors that might uh, militate against that tax? Again, quite a, a range in terms of the tax being imposed across the census uh, tracks, right? Um, a good place then to get a kind of overview of the relationship between the price and each individual variable. One might expect as the crime figures are higher, the price of the properties might go down. We see that now we wouldn't expect to have negative values and we don't, but in terms of just fitting a, a trend through the data, we can see there's a negative relationship between crime and uh, the median property prices. Um, in terms of uh, those more higher instance of the bigger properties, bigger, bigger lots, uh, we see a positive trend that we might expect. Uh, if you live close to factories and so on, uh, and non-retail businesses, one might expect if there's a higher incidence of industry, the property prices would be less. Uh, it would, in the case of the Charles River, if you live close to the Charles River, it's one, otherwise zero. There is uh, not a very extreme, but we can see uh, um, a positive relationship um, in terms of living close to the Charles River. 
negative relationship as we might expect as the as the level of air pollution goes up the property prices go down number of rooms in a property as the number of rooms go up the value of the property goes up the property is older uh, the property prices go down um, and distance to I, I think it's the urban um, centers of employment uh, the further away you are is, is it true to say that the property prices go up it would look as if it is so maybe living away from big urban areas produces or more densely populated areas uh, might produce um, uh, higher prices we need to look at the correlations there to see what's going on the distance to infrastructure the further you're away the property prices go down but there is a kind of a gap there uh, that might be interesting to explain. Uh, higher taxes, lower property prices, higher pupil teacher ratios, lower property prices. Uh, here it would appear uh, the higher proportion. So B is a proxy, I think, for African American. And again, there may be correlations there in terms of uh, if uh, African American um, minority groups lived in densely populated inner city areas, but there was also uh, expensive housing in co in coinciding with in the same census tracts, perhaps we're getting a positive there. And then um, when we look at the uh, the lower um, uh, status uh, um, people, where um, there is a, a higher proportion of individuals without high school diplomas. Uh, so low, lower status, we can see qu quite a sharp uh, drop off in the property price. OK, so a lot of that might be as we expect, but some counterintuitives uh, might be no harm to run a correlation matrix then uh, to observe what's going on and just take a, a, a quick uh, overview of we look at price and the correlation so negative relation negatively related to um uh, the, the lower status uh, so that's quite strong quite pronounced uh, b it's actually higher which might be a bit counterintuitive but that then might be uh, have a positive correlation with something else, right? So uh, that's what one worth uh, looking at. Uh, negative for higher pupil teacher ratios, negative for higher taxes, negative for uh, distance to key infrastructure, uh, to highways, right? That might be what we would expect. Uh, distance to employment centers is positive and so on. So a lot of what we observe here, we can directly observe here, but then the interrelationships might be obtained in the correla correlation matrix. It's worth going through to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, first thing we're going to do is just do a standard regression for the full sample, right? So for the entire 506 uh, properties, and we'll use stats model to get a kind of uh, a, a template with a, a a kind of conventional template output of coefficients and then t values p values and we do find again criminality higher levels of crime uh, you know the dependent variable here is the price the median price of the property and we get a um, a value here of 36 and the intercepts are quite high and then the criminality is negatively related uh, air pollution negatively related distance to employment, higher distance to employment, negative related, uh, tax negative related, and pupil teacher race and negative related. Uh, and then the lower status uh, has a downward effect on property prices would appear. Are they statistically significant? They are because the P values is less than 0 0.05. Likewise here, when we look at NOx, yeah, uh, higher air pollution has a negative uh, effect on property prices um, and with criminality again statistically significant okay in each instance okay so that's interesting but there were a few variables that weren't statistically significant and age was one right um, the industrial uh, living 
in an area with a lot of industry um industrial sites industrial zoning um not statistically significant right in terms of uh, being negatively correlated uh, negative impacts on the price okay so uh then i okay so we used here a traditional format and we got that out of the stats model libraries and that's quite useful and it looks like a traditional kind of statistical uh, presentation then when we use the sk learn it tends to configure the output in a slightly different way let's just run this again why are we getting difficulty okay so this is working and we'll try here must be something that's missing uh, let's check x not defined so is it lowercase x we just go back did we use x before we did okay let's just pause here fix this problem okay so i have to run this line of code uh first these two lines of code and then run here and hopefully that resolves it so it's basically just to define that the x variables the independent variables are defined as just dropping um from the data set the price and then y is the price so this is the target variable and these are the independent variables and we will we, for the full sample we will regress using the sk learn uh, library uh, and then we get the intercept we can output the intercept and then output then here the full sample coefficient estimates now it's not like the traditional format but we can compare the output here against what we had before and you can see that the uh, 3645 for the intercept is the same as what we have here and otherwise this, the values we're getting from the sk learn is the same as the values we got from the stats uh model models uh library right so if you make the comparison there you can see that they're the same so that's that's good okay so let's go back down then to our output here for the coefficient so these coefficients line up with the stats model uh library output and then we want to go back to run a regression and repeat uh if you like the regression so i want to perform ols regression again but it's important when i'm evaluating these models comparing ols to random forest that the performance of the model is not coming from overfitting so we should have a sample in sample and out of sample uh, performance and in order to do that we've got to split our data up into training and testing data and again we're going to pull out using sk learn selection we'll train test and split and so we're going to use uh 30 percent is going to be the test 70 percent is going to be the training data probably don't want to go below that um uh, that um 70 percent um because we've only 506 uh, rows we, we provide a seed and then we have an x data so we split our, our independent variables up into train and test and the Y's into train and test as well. And normally that's done in such a way that we don't uh, adulterate uh, the data sets, that the, 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 the train and the test look a little bit like each other. And likewise, uh, the Y uh, train and test look a little bit like each other, okay? So that's done in a fairly uh, curated type way and it happens in the background, um, okay? So let's run, um, the ordinary least squares and we train it so we do it with the training data so that's 70 percent of the complete data set and we output we get a 36.35 that's not unlike what we had seen before uh, up here with the full data set okay uh, but there are a few differences that uh, arise okay so that's for the this is for the training and we do we run the estimates then here for the uh, for the uh, training, it, it, they will be a little bit different. They will be just to compare the training with the full sample. 
uh, this is the full sample data set. You can see they're close. Most of the time, they share the same uh, sign. In this case, it doesn't. I suspect this one wasn't statistically significant. Um, again, looks similar, but there are some differences, right, between the train and the full data set. Okay, so let's go down. We'll continue. Now, when we're uh, doing an evaluation here on our model, right, we'll predict in sample and we'll, we'll estimate R squares, adjusted R squares, um, mean absolute error, uh, mean squared error, and the um, RMSE. And we do that for in sample and we get 74% in sample, not awful, and 73% in sample or for the training data. And then if we were to plot that out, the predicted prices against actual prices, uh, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, it's kind of unidimensional. Uh, uh, we could put a, f um, a line through that, look at the uh, variation and then we might look at uh, just how does the residuals or the error compare against the predicted prices? Is there any kind of pattern here or is it, uh, does it look quite random? Looks sort of random. Uh, we could do a normality check on the errors and we do seem to have clustering close to a mean of zero. That looks uh, and peaked a little bit skewed maybe here to the right but it doesn't appear awful. So it looks kind of conform as if it conforms to normal distribution. And then we want to compare, we want to see how this data actually works. If we use our model, how well does the model predict in the testing data? So out of sample, and we estimate the R squares and adjusted R squares, the MAE, the MSE, and the root mean squared error as well. And we see here, not it, it tolerates reasonably well. The R squares uh, kind of stand up reasonably well. We're on a 68, um, and that looks quite good. Uh, it's not awful. So that looks quite respectable. The 68 and the 71, not as good as in sample. Uh, and then we uh, move on to the random forests. Um, and uh, the random forests are quite good at when the relationships uh, are a little bit dynamic. Um, and uh, if the relationships are not very simply linear, if, they're, um, if that's not the case, and if there's a large number of features, uh, we might do well with uh, random forests. So let's just see what happens here. Um, and we'll import in again from the SK Learn, the random forest regressor. We go through the same process of training our data. We have already split the data. We have the X train and the Y train. So that's the same training data as we used before. Then we predict, we try to predict our data uh, in sample. And then we take a look at the R squares and the adjusted R squares. Now the R squares are goodness of fit and a perfect fit would be one or 100%. In this case, we're really getting superb numbers. The question is that might be coming out of overfitting and we would like to compare the performance of the model for the out of sample data. We can initially take a look here at the predicted against the actual and the look at the uh, behavior of the residuals with respect to the predicted so this is the error. And again, it's kind of random. Um, and then look for, but most importantly, then we're going to, to evaluate the performance of the model for out of sample, uh, not in sample, and see if those R squares stand up. Uh, they deteriorate, but they're still low 80s. Right, so we're getting 82% R squared, 80% adjusted, and the other uh, measure, measures of R root mean squared error 4.32, that's lower than the one uh, we had reported uh, before for out of sample. So 5.48 for the OLS. So in each 
metric here that we report out, we're finding for the out of sample, the random forest is doing a bit better. Um, that's not that unusual. You find a lot of the time random forests thrive at modeling linear combinations of a large number of features. And this seems to be true here, right? And you, some benefits of the random forest, you control in categorical variables, you, the data are automatically partitioned. And a lot of the time you might find if the data isn't uh, extreme, if the relationships aren't actually linear, then a multiple regression may not as be good as the random forest. So the performance of the model uh, can be maybe typically in the mid 70s, low 70s for OLS. But then for random forest, you'll probably be able to boost it up to the 80%. And that improvement in modeling is uh, something that uh, is very often achieved without too much forcing. So we don't have to beat a confession out of the data. It just very naturally appears. We're able to boost the performance of the models uh, using these random forest regressor algorithms. And I found this uh, entry here at Quora, uh, a selection of different thoughts um, comparing random forests to uh, ordinary least squares. And uh, I thought um, it's quite a nice overview of what's going on. Uh, and you might take a look at that. Okay, so that's uh, that uh, comparison then between OLS and uh, random forests.